Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Beinecke Illuminated. I'm your host, Tobias Cropper, and today we have a very special guest with us, one of the curators at the Beinecke Library. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself, madam? Sure. Hi, my name is Melissa Barton, and I am the curator of drama and prose writing for the Yale Collection of American Literature, which includes the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection of African American Arts and Letters. Within that title, tell me what is also included in the Yale Collection of American Literature. Um, we're going to be talking about the James Weldon Johnson uh, material, and we'll get into that in a bit. But uh, why don't you expand a little bit on what is also included in that? So the Yale Collection of American Literature is noted for its uh, bibliographic strength in the history of American literature from its beginnings to the present in terms of printed books. We have first editions of almost every book published uh, in, in American literary history. And, uh, and then in um, our archival collections, our strength is noted in, especially in the high modern period of American letters. So we have the papers of Gertrude Stein, William Carlos Williams, Ezra Pound, um, uh, Eugene O'Neill, Thornton Wilder, uh, many noted uh, modern writers of that modern period. And the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection strength fits right into that strength as well. And its, it's uh, core is in the Harlem Renaissance period, which is of a piece with American modernism. So they, the, the, the strengths kind of all mesh together. We have, as you said, we have a lot of very prominent uh, artists, writers, poets, uh, involved in the Harlem Renaissance activists. And, and what we're gonna be talking about today are a few of those correspondents that are in the James Weldon Johnson collection, correct? Yeah, one of the most incredible things about the great strength of the James Weldon Johnson collection in the Harlem Renaissance, which is noted, is the way in which the story of that extraordinary period can be told by reading its letters, by reading the letters between um, the individuals who participate and we have so many different sides, um, so many different pairings of correspondence in that period. And it tells a really rich and diverse story across um, multiple generations of individuals and, you know, uh, both the professional and the personal. Um, there's a really uh, wide, wide range. Why do you like reading people's letters? Uh, specifically in this James Walden Johnson collection, we have a countless number of correspondence, right? And very interesting stories uh, that, you know, go back and forth. And we have a great number of stories that are connected. A lot of libraries only have part of the letter and we don't have the other side, but a lot of these, we have the whole story, sort of seeing the, the actual back and forth between the two. So uh, what is your fascination with this? And um, why are we looking at this today? you really get this window into a, 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 a social interaction um, at a you know, time when maybe we're missing social interaction a little bit. Um, it's, it's this incredible, unlike you know, reading someone's diary where you are reading their very personal thoughts, with the letter you're reading into a relationship. It's almost like um, you have walked up to a pair of people at a cocktail party in the middle of their conversation and you get to kind of stand there and listen to their conversation um, and hear, you know, gossip and you know news and all the things that are going on and try to figure out like what what it is that they're talking about what mysteries there are and some of the things like letters i have to share today have mysteries in them um that um, and how you can explain them and kind of puzzle them out and piece them together so that's what i love love about them fantastic all right let's get into the material Okay, so the first letter I have to share is a letter from Zora Neal Hurston to Langston Hughes. It's Hurston and Hughes were very close friends until they weren't. Um, and this letter is from 1928 when Hurston is writing from Eatonville, Florida, her hometown, um, visiting there uh, to Hughes, who is in college at Lincoln University in Lincoln, Pennsylvania. Um, the previous year, Hurston and Hughes had spent part of the summer traveling together collecting folklore in uh, Alabama. And Hurston is writing to Hughes now about more folklore. She's reporting and, and sharing in the letter um, stories that, uh, and jokes that she has collected. And then um, asking uh, Langs uh, and giving Langston some encouragement. He's, he uh, has just he published his second book of poetry he was kind of discouraged about the reception to it. And she's saying that she has been going around reading it to people and everybody thinks it's great. Um, and then uh, she's trying to get him to come uh, down. So at the end of the letter, in the third page, she says, I am getting inside of Negro art and lore. I am beginning to see really, and when you find me, I shall 
uh, paint, point things out and see if you see them as I do. You are coming as soon as school closes, aren't you? Langston, Langston, this is going to be big. Most gorgeous possibilities are showing themselves constantly. So it's this incredible uh, representation of her, her um, vivaciousness, her charisma, and her relationship with him. She signs it lovingly, yours, Zora. Oh, she mentions before she signs off that she is thinking about sending presents to their mutual patron, a woman named Charlotte Mason, who uh, had both Zora Hurston and Langston Hughes call her godmother. Um, so she says, I am sending her uh, godmother some orange blossoms. Um, it's just this incredibly newsy letter that illustrates uh, some of Hurston's collecting practice, um, but also their friendship with one another. You know, working with this material for years, um, do you feel like you have like the perfect grasp on what type of people they were just based on reading all of their writing? Sometimes I do, and you know, you never, I never know. I, I, I try to be humble about that, even though I, I think of them, I think of myself as being on a first name basis with them. They use each other's first names, you know, but I, I try to be humble about feeling like I, you know, know them. I feel, you know, I, I, I think I'm someone who's of the opinion that Zora Neale Hurston is someone who was impossible to know. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can learn a lot about her in her letters, but she, uh, she was somebody who was, seemed, seems to me to have been very guarded in her personality too, um, and seems to have kind of presented different sides of herself to different people. Right. Um, but I do, think, I do think people reveal more or less of themselves. Um, there are some other people who are, who are much more reserved um, where I feel it's really difficult to get a sense of their personality. And then there are some, like this letter and some others that I will show, where you really get a sense of their personality from reading just, you know, a handful of them. This is a letter from Alan Locke to Claude McKay. I might say just a word about who both of them are, since they're um, less well known. Alan Locke is often considered the dean of the Harlem Renaissance. He was a professor of philosophy at Howard University, and he was a, um, an editor uh, and a kind of uh, tastemaker in that period. He edited the period's most important and influential anthology of writing called The New Negro. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and Claude McKay was a poet and a novelist, um, very celebrated in the period, still very much read now, uh, but perhaps less well known than uh, someone like Langston Hughes, um, and uh, was born in Jamaica, immigrated to the United States, and then lived a lot of his life abroad in Europe um, and North Africa. Um, so this letter from uh, Locke to McKay is one where I said there were going to be mysteries, and this is a letter that's full of kind of suggestiveness and innuendo that I think tells us something about the relationship between these two men and the way they speak to one another, but right. it might leave us with a lot of questions. Um, it begins, Dear Claude, delighted to hear from you, even at the expense of a curtain lecture. I don't intend ever to get married anyway, so I pose an occasional, um, so I suppose an occasional this sort of thing is poetic justice. So, you know, what does that mean? We don't know. Um, a curtain lecture, I love that because McKay in some of his other letters, notably his ones to Langston Hughes, you know, he's kind of irascible. He's, he's, he was a grouchy person, it seems like. And so <laughs> to imagine a letter that Locke has received from McKay that's full of, that begins with a lecture kind of fits with our sense of him. Um, uh, the letter refers to several other people uh, who are kind of in their circle. Thurman is, Wallace Thurman, it says Langston is in Havana after a prolonged tilt with a novel. Um, one may expect it to be fine. Um, and so there's this kind of idea that they're all talking about one another. There's that kind of idea of the moment of the period that there's so much literary excitement going on in this time. Everyone is talking about each other's writing. It ends with this very kind of suggestive sign off where uh, Locke says, you know, uh, I'm sure that your new book will be interesting. What is it all about? My only advice, and this, that is quite gratuitous, is that you might find it interesting and even probable to visit over and observe the newest Negro, who after all is quite a strange animal. Among other things, he seems to be in a strange state of sexual transformation. Whether this conforms to the Renaissance formula as laid down by yours truly, I can't say, primarily because I don't know. But I do know that the Negro is shedding his Puritanism. 
the best ever. Sincerely, Alan Locke. <laughs> you know, when you're when you're going through these, how often do you, um, you know, try to find the other pieces to it? Because obviously, we don't have it all. Is there uh, moments where you just have to know, so you go searching through different libraries and requesting material, or does it end here and you try to make assumptions? <laughs> how does that work? You know, it's a puzzle. And I think when uh, you can sometimes piece things together from what you have, um, sometimes you can go after uh, what exists on the other side. And so um, with someone like Locke, you know, um, Locke's letters to Langston Hughes uh, have been the source of a lot of interest and speculation. There was there's a, a quest, long been questions about the relationship between those two men. And uh, so we often show those letters to students here. And then, um, you know, we always say, you could actually go look at the other side. The Hughes' letters to Locke are extant. They're in Locke's papers, which are at Howard University. So you can sometimes go look, and sometimes you can't. Um, Hughes's letters to Zora Neale Hurston don't survive. Um, Hurston's archive, is uh, such as it is, it's very small and it's scattered. Um, and so the other side isn't there and you have to kind of infer or guess what, what could have been said. Uh, you know, curators aren't supposed to have favorites, like parents aren't supposed to have favorite children. And I don't <laughs> have favorite children, but I do have a favorite collection, which yeah. is Langston Hughes's papers. Um, and I love Langston Hughes's papers because they're so rich in correspondence. I mean, he received letters from so many notable figures throughout his life, um, not only in this period we're talking about, but even later. And so um, there, are, there are really extraordinary letters to him from figures like Lorraine Hansberry, Audre Lorde, um, you know, Amiri Baraka, you know, going on into the, the later years of his, of his life. Um, it's a really amazing collection. This, this uh, envelope that I'm showing on my screen right now is from a small group of just five letters um, that were written by a woman named Gwendolyn Bennett to Harold Jackman um, in 1925 and 1926. Gwendolyn Bennett was a poet and a, a a uh, visual artist, a graphic designer, and um, illustrator. And um, Harold Jackman was a school teacher um, in Harlem, very close friends with the poet County Cullen and with that whole circle of younger um, Harlem Renaissance figures. Um, and Gwendolyn Bennett won a fellowship in uh, 1924 to study art in Paris for a year. So these five letters from her to Harold Jackman are from that time that she was in Paris. Um, so you can see here it's postmarked from Paris uh, and it's addressed to Jackman who lives on 134th Street in New York City. Um, these letters are amazing in the way that they kind of capture so many facets of transatlantic modernism. Um, they, uh, you know, she is meeting people abroad, like she attends a salon at Gertrude Stein's apartment, she attends um, Henri Matisse's salon, um, she meets Ernest Hemingway, she becomes friends with George Antile, an opera singer. Um, she, uh, she, so she's getting all around and then she also, she and Harold have this correspondence where they're talking about what they're reading. He's sending her print uh, materials from the Harlem Renaissance. He sends her issues of the Crisis Magazine and Opportunity Magazine. He sends her copies of County Cullen's uh, new book. Uh, he tries to send her a copy of The New Negro that is, was a very expensive book at that time. It was $5, which is about $65 in today's dollars. And um, he, and it gets lost and it's this whole thing, you know, and she becomes friends. She befriends Sylvia Beach, um, who was uh, James Joyce's publisher. And she gets a copy of Ulysses that she has to disguise to send back to Harold Jackman because it's banned in the United States. Um, uh, so, uh, so it's this kind of extraordinary record of, of reading in this period um, and of, of her experiences. Uh, in this letter, she talks about uh, finding a studio in Montmartre. And then she says, um, Paris is Charleston mad. I who never did the Charleston in my life am now dancing it in the best of Parisian places. <laughs> it's done here, you know. That's all there is to that. Which is just amazing that this dance that we associate so closely with this period, with you know jazz and with the Harlem Renaissance, is you know she is kind of seeing the fad of it happen um, right. in real time, um, and it's signed just 
Gwen. Um, she also calls him Rosebud, and you know they have all these nicknames for each other. She, they refer to the writers who are friends in their circle by their first names. Send me Langston's book. Um, I just read County's book. What's Wally? Which is Wallace Thurman. They all called him Wally. Oh, uh, really? he had <laughs> you know, it's just those those kinds of things are just wonderful. This letter, this is a part of the letter. She is visited by uh, Paul. Paul. Paul is Paul Robeson. Um, and, uh, and she is also in, in touch with Jesse Fawcett, who was the literary editor at the crisis um, and was a friend of theirs as well. So she says, Jesse and Paul told me about the statue that Antonio Salami did of Paul. I hope I get a chance to see it when I get back. They too seem to think it was very wonderful. And then um, this paragraph, I just love. She says, I made a mistake about Hemingway's first name. It's Ernest instead of Alan, and he is the author of, and there's just this mess. <laughs> and then she says, this is very funny. I wanted capital letters and put down the wrong key, so this conglomerate mess came out instead. <laughs> he is the author of In Our Times, that book of short stories that has received such favorable comment in the States. When I wrote of him last, I did not know him so well. That's why I got his name mixed up. She called him Alan in her previous letter. She's like, Alan, I think that's the name. And then she kind of goes on to the next thing. He is a charming fellow, big and blustery with an outdoors quality about him, coupled with a boyishness that makes him just right. I have a beautifully autographed copy of his book. Um, and then she goes on to refer to these other books, The Sailor's Return and Dark Laughter, which are both uh, works of fiction by white writers. Uh, the Sailor's Return is by um, uh, a British author named David Garnett. And then um, Dark Laughter is Sherwood Anderson. And they're both uh, uh, works of fiction about, uh, in part about black life, um, even though they're by white authors. And that those are, th which was a, you know, a thing um, in this period. And, um, and that she's reading these books and kind of assessing them is, is, is kind of amazing. I love the personality that just, it's so apparent in, in letters like this, you know, that they are not just these, these untouchable, you know, figures, they are human beings. Absolutely, yeah, these are people who we put on pedestals in some ways, because they're these, you know, lions of, of, of history, of literary history, and to, that we can see, you know, that you know, Gwendolyn Bennett started typing on the wrong row of her keyboard sometimes too, you know, <laughs> and um, gets people's names wrong too, um, is, is really amazing. And her, her, she is just so full of life in just, you know, I exhibited several of these, um, these from this group of letters in um, an exhibit I did on the Harlem Renaissance several years ago. And people would say to me, Gwendolyn Bennett seems like an amazing person just from reading just these three letters of hers. Um, she's really, she's really amazing. So just to clarify for the people watching, this stuff is available to uh, look at. Um, some on the digital library, some have been digitized and others uh, can be looked at in the building once we open again. <laughs> but um, why don't you uh, give us just a little more information about how people can find these things, what type of things are actually digitized and can be looked at from the comfort of your own home and uh, things of that nature. Sure. Um, quite a few of these groups of letters are in Beinecke's Digital Library, which you can um, find on our website. And when whole groups of letters are in one uh, grouping, in one um, record, as we call it, in there, I find that it can be easier to download a PDF of the whole group set so that you can um, browse through them and read them more easily. And there's a button in the Digital Library export as PDF that you can use to do that. So well, this has been great, Melissa. Thank you once again for coming on the show. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to put out there or any final thoughts or comments you had on this collection or anything else? I just, I love looking at this correspondence and it's, it's one of the most um, exciting and pleasurable things about uh, this work and that the ways in which you can both, you know, both know and, and not really know people in them is, is really, um, exciting thing about working with them. And uh, I thank you, Tobias, for the opportunity. Um, and I hope everyone enjoys seeing them. Great. So uh, once again, this material is available for anyone who wants to see it. Go to beinecke.library.yale.edu and it should be pretty clear from there. We've made the website a lot more user-friendly, so <laughs> hopefully you're able to find what you need to find. 
But yeah, and I, anyone who has questions about this material is always welcome to email me. My name is Melissa Barton. My email is melissa.barton at yale.edu. Perfect. Uh, so thank you for tuning in to another episode of Binary Key Illuminated, and we will see you next time. Thanks.